Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative. Mr. Rod Rosenstein was sworn in as the 37th Deputy Attorney General of the United States on April 26, 2017 by Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Mr. Rosenstein has had a distinguished career in public service. He began his legal career in the Public Integrity Section of the Department of Justice's Criminal Division and later served as counsel to the Deputy Attorney General and Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Tax Division. Until his appointment by President Trump, Mr. Rosenstein <clears throat> served for 12 years as the United States Attorney for the District of Maryland. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the Wharton School and a uh, JD from, the, from Harvard Law School. General Rosenstein, your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety, and we ask that you summarize your testimony uh, in five minutes. Welcome. We're pleased to have you here. Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify as part of your oversight of the United States Department of Justice. Uh, I appreciate your support and concern for the Department of Justice. I know several of you are alumni of the department. Uh, two, in fact, served alongside me as United States attorneys, uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be with you today. As Deputy Attorney General, my job is to help the Attorney General to manage our department's components, including seven main justice litigating divisions, 94 U.S. Attorney's offices, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the United States Marshal Service, the Office of Justice Programs, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, the Office of the Inspector General, and many others. Our department includes over 115,000 employees and tens of thousands of contractors stationed in every state and territory and in many foreign nations. We prevent terrorism and violent crime illegal drug distribution, fraud, corruption, child abuse, civil rights violations, and countless other threats to the American people. We enforce tax laws, antitrust laws, and environmental laws. We represent the United States in the Supreme Court, the Courts of Appeal, and the District Courts, and in state and territorial courts. We protect federal judges, manage federal prisons, review parole applications, oversee the bankruptcy system, we manage, uh, we assist tribal governments, and we adjudicate immigration cases. We provide legal advice to the president and to every federal agency. We implement grant programs and support state and local law enforcement. We combat waste, fraud, and other misconduct involving employees and contractors. We resolve foreign claims and represent our government in international law enforcement forums. We collect, analyze, and disseminate law enforcement data, and we perform countless other important functions for the American people. Department of Justice employees are united by a shared understanding that our mission is to pursue justice, protect public safety, preserve government property, defend civil rights, and promote the rule of law. The mission attracted me to law enforcement, but the people who carry out that mission are what I treasure most about my job. With very few exceptions, they are honorable, principled, and trustworthy. America's federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies are more professional today than ever. Rigorous scrutiny by internal affairs offices and external oversight agencies has resulted in increased accountability and higher standards. When wrongdoing occurs, we are more likely to discover it, and we remedy it. That is critical to building and maintaining public confidence. Over the past eight months, I've spoken with thousands of department employees around the country. I remind them that justice is not only our name, justice is our mission. Justice requires a fair and impartial process, and that's why we have a special responsibility to follow ethical and professional standards. In 1941, Attorney General Robert Jackson said that the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who tempers zeal with human kindness 
seeks truth and not victims, serves the law and not factional purposes, and approaches the task with humility. Under the leadership of Attorney General Jeff Sessions and an experienced team appointed by President Trump, the Department of Justice is working tirelessly to protect American citizens and to uphold the rule of law. And today I look forward to discussing some of our department's important work. Following the U.S. Attorney's Manual and the example set by past Department of Justice officials, we always seek to accommodate congressional oversight requests while protecting the integrity of our investigations, preserving the department's independence, and safeguarding sensitive information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rosenstein. Um, I'll start by recognizing myself for questions. Last week, Director Ray indicated that the normal procedures were not followed in the investigation of former Secretary Clinton's email server. He said it was not normal protocol to have witnesses sit in the room during an interview of the target of an investigation. If the Inspector General determines that normal protocol was not followed or that the investigation was closed or otherwise tainted for political purposes, would that be a justification in your mind to reopen the investigation? Mr. Chairman, we are certainly uh, anticipating the outcome of that Inspector General investigation. Uh, as you know, that's been ongoing for some time. I'm hopeful that it'll be concluded within the next couple of months. Uh, and uh, when we get those results, we'll take appropriate action. I don't know exactly what the findings are going to be, but uh, it's always appropriate for us to review uh, any findings of impropriety or misconduct and take appropriate action. When you uh, announced your decision to uh, terminate the employment of uh, FBI Director Comey. Uh, in that uh, decision, uh, you announced some uh, practices uh, that uh, I took it to mean uh, you thought were inappropriate actions on the part of the former FBI Director. Do you think that those actions on his part would merit uh, further investigation in how that whole matter was conducted? Mr. Chairman, as you're aware, the uh, Inspector General is conducting an investigation into the handling of that Hillary Clinton email investigation. And uh, I believe that the matters that you've referred to are part of his investigation. The memo that uh, you're familiar with uh, that I provided reflects my personal opinion. It's not an official finding of misconduct. That's the Inspector General's job. He'll reach his own independent determination. Uh, but as you pointed out, my views about it uh, are already known. Uh, are you aware of any prior efforts by the uh, Judiciary Committee, this committee, to unduly restrict the ability of the intelligence community to do its job of protecting our national security? I'm not personally aware of any, no, sir. Are you aware that this committee has primary oversight of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act due in part to the significant constitutional and legal questions that government surveillance raises? Mr. Chairman, I... Uh, I respect the Congress's decision about uh, which committee has oversight. I know that both this committee and uh, the Intelligence Committee have an interest in that issue. Well, given, given that you understand this committee's jurisdiction and its history of providing the intelligence community with the tools it needs, why would we, in the words of the Department, attempt to, quote, dismantle Section 702 of our nation's most important surveillance program? Well, I certainly would hope that wouldn't be the case. I don't know who made the statement you're referring to. Uh, I know the department obviously has expressed its opinion uh, about the reauthorization, which we think is critically important, of Section 702. I respect there are differences of opinion, but uh, I think the department has been very clear that we believe it's essential to national security that Section 702 be reauthorized. Well, we agree with you that it's essential that Section 702 be reauthorized. We also believe that it's essential uh, that the civil liberties of American citizens be protected and that a standard be imposed uh, on the uh, examination of uh, uh, information about U.S. citizens incidentally gathered uh, as a part of the Section 702 program with the surveillance of non-U.S. citizens outside the United States, uh, but <clears throat> incidentally gathering information about U.S. citizens and then being uh, looked into uh, by uh, agents of uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation Without a warrant. I'm not aware of uh, that being appropriate in any other type of investigation that they might conduct. And we're not talking about terrorist attacks. We're not talking about national security because we have 
clearly distinguish that. We're simply talking about crimes that have already occurred that are being investigated uh, as they should be investigated by the department, but under the procedures that the American people would expect that they would follow uh, to protect their civil liberties in other, uh, other circumstances. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, as you know, I've had the advantage over the last eight months of having a role in overseeing our national security operations. I discussed this with Director Ray yesterday, and if, if you'd like, I could give you a detailed explanation. It might take a couple of minutes, but uh, I'd be happy to give you some details. But the, the, the bottom line is that uh, it really is critical to national security that the FBI have the ability to query the data. That's the issue here. Uh, and our legislation allows them to do that. But if the query provides a hit that they want to read an email, they want to see other documentation, they want to see uh, in its full form, they're required to get a warrant under those circumstances. And I discussed this with Director Ray, and uh, what happens when the FBI conducts these queries, Mr. Chairman, is that typically their leads uh, that are not necessarily based on probable cause, but based on a lead, a suspicion, and the ability to query that data and then follow up on it gives the FBI the opportunity to put two and two together, to connect the dots. Uh, there are lots way. of leads that uh, uh, any law enforcement person would like to pursue, but we have protections against them pursuing it without uh, appropriate uh, standard for doing it in a whole host of uh, other ways to protect people uh, from unreasonable searches. And this is a search uh, of information about uh, a United States citizen. Well, it's, uh, it's a query as a constitutional matter. Uh, what we're Allow talking the initial about. query. Once that uh, results in something the agent wants to look at, I don't see how you distinguish the further reading of emails or other things from a search. If I could take a, a couple of minutes, I could explain to you, uh, I talked with Director Ray about an appropriate way to explain this publicly. Uh, hypothetically, uh, let's say, for example, that uh, local police department receives a call that somebody has purchased a large quantity of hydrogen peroxide and something made the clerk at the store suspicious about that, so he contacts the local police. There's no probable cause, there's nothing illegal about what the person did, but something that caused concern. The local police may refer General Rosenstein, let me interrupt you because the very specific instance that you are citing was cited to us in our discussions with the FBI, and that very specific protection for the FBI was added to our legislation. Well, the example I'm providing is a situation where there would not be probable cause, but we think it would be appropriate for the FBI to follow up. And what we're trying to avoid is a situation where we re-erect re a wall that would prevent the FBI from gaining access to information that might allow them to connect a lead to information that implicates national security. Thank you. My time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes.